Hi there, I'm Dante Shepard. Uh, you may know me from such web comics as Surviving the World and Surviving the World 2, Electric Boogaloo. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about who I am and what I do, um, partly because I haven't completely given all the answers most of the time, which I'm unable to do so. Uh, but I'd like to try to take this opportunity to clear up some of those misconceptions uh, and at the same time provide you a little bit of insight into the scientific research that I work on uh, which may explain why some of you were confused in the first place. So some of you think that I'm a graduate student. Uh, some of you actually think that I'm an undergraduate student. Uh, some of you think that I do surviving the world full time, uh, which I don't. Uh, some of you think that I'm a stoned hippie, uh, most likely because I wear contacts for about 16 hours a day. Uh, some of you think that I'm a douchebag. And some of you actually think that I Photoshop my goatee uh, onto my chin in every comic image that I make. While I can't answer all of those points, uh, because some of them are incredibly, incredibly stupid, uh, I can try to explain uh, a, a little bit more about what I do. Uh, so I am a full-time scientist. I have a PhD in chemical engineering from Cornell University. I can't direct you towards the some of the past research that I've done, uh, partly because my collaborators have asked not to be affiliated with Surviving the World, uh, just based on some of the connections and networks that they have, completely understandable. Similarly, I can't uh, tell you the actual name of Fred Paulson Institute, which is where I used to work, uh, because again, people there do not exactly want to be affiliated with Surviving the, uh, the World in terms of their scientific research. And on another vein, I can't tell you the name of the government lab in Maryland that I currently work at, uh, not because they've asked me not to say what their name is, uh, but because if I do, that would be potentially affiliating them in a way that does not benefit them. And if it does not benefit them and I use that affiliation, uh, then that could cost me my job. And I like being employed, so I can't exactly tell you. Uh, their name, unfortunately, either. Uh, with all that in mind, I can tell you a little bit about some of the scientific research I'm doing right now. I can't give you the full picture, uh, mostly because it hasn't been published yet. Uh, once it is published, uh, even then I won't be able to direct you in that direction, because again, collaborators have asked me not to name their names. Uh, but I, I can try to provide you with as much information right now as I can, all those caveats aside. Uh, so currently I'm working on something called super hydrophobic surfaces. Uh, these pretty much sound almost exactly like what that word means, if you know what that word means. Uh, essentially you have surfaces, uh, and these surfaces have some degree of micron scale or nanoscale roughness along them, uh, and so that they will end up repelling water and some water-based materials. Uh, so essentially this, this is a fact that doesn't necessarily occur because of the chemistry that does have some effect. Uh, for the most part it is a physical structure effect. Uh, so if you take you know, a, a, a completely flat surface uh, and you create some type of nanoscale ridges or nanoscale pillars or, or gaps, whatever the case may be, uh, if these are small enough air pockets can form along that surface, uh, which then water will be unable, in many cases will be unable or uninterested in seeping into. Uh, and so then a water drop will just kind of sit uh, on top of it uh, like a sphere. So if you think about it, if you're just to take like your hand or um, most uh, tabletop surfaces, if you just flick a water drop on onto it, that water drop will, will tr almost kind of spread out and try to take, cover as much area as possible. Now, if that surface is hydrophobic, uh, what that w water drop will start to do is it'll almost start to form a, a, like a half a sphere on top of that surface. And if it becomes super hydrophobic, then the contact angles at the sides will be about a, at least 150 degrees. Uh, and it can get all the way up to 180 degrees. So at this point, the water droplets are just kind of rolling across the surface. Uh, they can be completely bouncing off. And it actually looks really cool uh, if you're able to see something like this. Maybe you've seen this in nature. Uh, pretty much all super hydrophobic research is inspired by the lotus leaf. Uh, so water droplets on top of this will actually just completely beat up and roll off. It's kind of a self-cleansing mechanism. Uh, in nature, but there are a, a lot of applications where this could really be uh, very useful in, in real world applications. Uh, maybe you've seen this, I remember seeing this way back in the day, uh, that there was a late night commercial for a aerosol spray and you could spray it on your car windshield 
uh, so that water would just pretty much just bead right off of it and just roll off. And so that way you wouldn't need to use your wipers as much because that was great scientific research. Hey, apparently people bought it if it was being sold at night. Or maybe not, because they only saw it once. Uh, but you can actually potentially make super hydrophobic surfaces in, in your home. Uh, they may not get all the way up to 180 degrees, but you, you can do it. Uh, so this is just an example of something which you probably can't do unless you have a, uh, a, 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 a glove box or glove bag or a hood like I do in the lab. I really wish I was showing this into you in, the, in my government lab, but again, I could get fired if I did that. Uh, so this is just a glass surface simple glass surface, really nothing to it, a glass slide. Uh, but what I did was I kind of took a uh, mixture of a couple different silicon-based um, particles. Uh, this is based on work done by Thomas McCarthy uh, at UMass. And what you do is you just kind of mix this in air for really no more than two minutes uh, in the presence of water at the right humidity. Uh, what'll happen is, whereas opposed to a normal glass surface, the water would just kind of spread out, and if I show you this right with this background here, and it looks like I'm flicking off the camera. That's wonderful. All right. <laughs> Focus in the middle. Right, the syringe comes down. You can kind of see that that water droplet is hitting and is completely bouncing off. Yeah, so you can kind of see that it's a really simple surface. It looks completely transparent, uh, but water's pretty much bouncing off of it. And that's about a contact angle of 170 degrees. Uh, and if I had a perfect balance of my hands, I could actually hold that in front and kind of just roll it back and forth, uh, kind of like one of those balls in one of those old labyrinth games that you probably don't have if you're young and, and were born in the 90s, which is a scary thought in itself anyway. Kids in the 90s are in college. Jeez. All right. Uh, but actually, what you can do, and I think I may have just ran out of water demonstrating in here, uh, but you can take something like a Teflon surface. Now, you do have Teflon surfaces in your in your home if you have some pots and pans. I don't recommend you do this method uh, with with your mother or father's or your own pots and pans since they would immediately become non-stick. Uh, but you can make them super hydrophobic. So if you take a uh, again piece of Teflon and a piece of sandpaper uh, and you just rub it back and forth on the, this Teflon for about ah, for about 10 seconds here All right, so um, there's usually some cleaning what you do with this with acetone and water and then blow it dry with nitrogen. Uh, this is based on work by Jonathan Rothstein, I think at MIT. That's kind of embarrassing that I've forgotten. Uh, but essentially, uh, whereas if you took, uh, trying this here, a normal surface, as if you can see, you can't see that too perfectly there, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, can't see that as well as I was hoping. Um, but in most cases, when you apply a water droplet, it'll just kind of sit on top there. But if you add it to the super hydrophobic area, now you can kind of see that it's just completely rolling right off. That's the problem with Teflon being white. Unfortunately, can't see this as well as I wanted to see. Uh, so, that may have been a failed video, but whatever, I'm going to post it anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, so essentially just by with the right sandpaper, it's got to be about 320 grit. 
uh, if you take if you have something like this at home uh, and you apply for just about 10 seconds in any direction uh, water droplets can get up to about 150 degrees um, possibly just slightly below that which doesn't make them completely super hydrophobic um, but it actually will look pretty cool if you do that kind of as an experiment where someone can actually see it a lot better than what I was just trying to show you. I do have pictures like this uh, posted uh, online and I'll probably try to link, link to them underneath the video. Uh, so if uh, otherwise, hopefully that answers most of your questions about the science that I do and uh, a little bit about some other stuff. And you know, I'll just answer one more question while I'm at it, uh, which is pretty common on why do I have a goatee? Apparently, if you have a goatee by itself, that makes you a douchebag. If you have a beard by itself, that makes you Amish. If you have a mustache by itself, well, obviously you're a porno star. And if you have, or maybe not a very good star, but if you have mutton chops on your own, that makes you a Revolutionary War uh, British general. So apparently you can't have a goatee on its own. Um, well, why do I have a goatee then? Well, I don't want to have the same facial hair as my father. Uh, which I think is pretty understandable. Uh, and otherwise, I do have a bunch of scars on my chin, which I don't exactly want to be visible. So that pretty much leaves me with a goatee. And if that still bothers you, I don't care. <laughs> Screw you. Uh, but otherwise, thanks for watching. This has been Science uh, Late Night with Dante Shepard in his storage closet. <laughs>